Welcome to Soundbridge Music's Featured Artist Interview. In this series, we get to know front range artists who not only shape the local music scene, but who joined the Soundbridge Music in its mission to use the power of music to improve the lives of individuals and bring communities together. We're so excited to be here today with Renee Moffitt. Renee is a Denver-based singer-songwriter serving up heavy pours of poignant lyrics and resonant melodies. Enjoy. Well, maybe it's the fact that I'm getting older Perhaps it's the world in which we live Well, Renee, welcome. Thank you. Today. So uh, you are uh, known for heady folk. For the open-hearted. I try. So, <laughs> uh, oh, Before we get too far, I, sure. I do want to just say congratulations. You have a new addition. Thank you. Yes, my wife and I just, uh, we welcomed our, our first kid, uh, a baby girl, uh, last Saturday. So she's a, she's a week old. Oh, wow. And yeah. that explains the, the, the sleep. The right. lack yeah. of sleep, well, yeah. Well, I, I think you're you're looking you're looking pretty awake, so you're, you. you're faking it well. <laughs> I think actually that's a, a, a skill that you have to develop as a as an artist, oftentimes. Oh, so. for sure, especially when you know you've sang that song that meant a lot to you once, uh, and maybe when you first wrote it, and then after the five hundredth performance, <laughs> and you just got to dial it in. I mean, that's what the Stones are doing this whole time. Oh yeah, know? that's so. right, and they, they do it well. They do it very <laughs> that's well. That's right for so. a hefty price. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so you, how long have you been here in, in Denver now? Uh, really, four years. It's, uh, it was four years in October. Um, my, we were living in Dallas uh, for a couple of years. I grew up in Texas, but I, I most recently was living in the, uh, the Dallas area for about three years. I met my now wife, and um, four years ago, she had a job at the Denver Art Museum. So mm. uh, we decided to head up here. Um, I've always loved Colorado, even though, even though I've only visited a few times before we moved here. But we love camping, love the outdoors. Um, we have dogs, so it seemed like a good fit. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I noticed you spent a lot of time in the Washington, D.C. area. Yes, yeah. And yeah. I'm actually from uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Oh, so, very cool. Yeah, so yeah. I know the, you know, roughly know the area. Yeah, no, and it's a, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a great bustling scene. I think it was, I spent six years in D.C., and that was uh, probably the, the, the largest city that I lived in, you know, uh, up until then. And uh, very good, you know, singer-songwriter scene, very good music culture, music and arts culture. And so I enjoyed it a lot. I mean, it was, it was I kind of sort of felt like I came of age there in D.C. So D.C. is always going to have a special place in my heart. Well, it looked like I, I saw that, uh, I guess, you're, you're, kinda, you, you, you're kind of a latecomer to the yes. music scene. Yep, yep. You didn't really take it seriously until you were 26. Yeah, yeah. And that was when you were, uh, I mean, before that you were... Uh, you were a soccer collegiate stock, soccer uh, division one soccer player. Is yeah, that right? I, pl I played college soccer. Grew up playing that in uh, when I was growing up as a kid and in high school, and then played college and and uh, you know it allowed me to sort of you know get out of my hometown and see you know and travel quite a bit you know traveling with soccer teams and stuff like that and and then you know making a bunch of friends and. But uh, I, I, uh, it was, you know, it was such, you know, I still follow soccer quite a bit, you know, every time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, especially when the World Cup rolls around and then, you know, we go out and see the Rapids games here in oh, sure. Colorado quite a bit. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm true blue with soccer, but, uh, uh, and then that kind of led me to the East Coast, uh, just from a location standpoint. And then, um, you know, I got involved with school and once, you know, I graduated, um, you know, I had really discovered that I'd been playing music a lot, you know, in oh. like kind of behind the scenes. Um, you know, always had a guitar at home, but on college campuses, I was always sneaking into the, 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 the piano practice rooms uh -huh. to do stuff. And, and at one point I realized, you know, when I was, you know, 25, 26, I was like, maybe I should start following that. You know, maybe I should start paying attention to that. So. Well, that's, yeah, so that's, that's a big... So you, you moved from I think it was Virginia Beach. Yep. To and you moved up to Washington D.C. Yep. yep. And you just uh, um, you you started doing some schooling, some education yeah. uh, with music. Now what 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 did that look like? And, and I guess I'm kind of I don't know. Question I always you know they have some musicians who are really educated. Yep. And some who are not so educated, and they all kind of jump into the same stew. Right. And and how did you feel about the education, the music education that she did? So I grew up playing piano, but of course, mm -hmm. you know, as you might know, there aren't a lot of pianos in bars in the day and age. You know, yeah. you really, you have to go to New York City to find that. I mean, yeah. and uh, I was living in D.C. at the time, uh, and when I decided to take up songwriting, I needed to pick up the guitar. And it was probably, of the two instruments, guitar and piano, it was the guitar that I had the least amount of experience on. So um, it just made sense to me to try to get some sort of formative, you know, fundamental training 
uh, on the guitar and there in DC was a school called the Levine School of Music and it's a place where you know if your kid shows promise at age five you send them to Levine and then they graduate and go to like you know Juilliard something oh, like wow. that. Okay. But they had a whole rock um, and, and sort of acoustic and acoustic rock department where they had a handful of, of, of instructors who were actively gigging, were playing shows of their own, um, but also were classically trained. And so it was a really nice bridge for me to be able to get experience from someone who had, you know, toured a lot, but also knew enough fundamentals to give me a good, you know, a good base to start from. So it was, I felt it was important. I felt it was the only way that I was going to get a solid foundation on the guitar. Um, and it really gave me a lot of insight into just you know, a good practice regimen, you know, keeping things like that um, uh, over the course of your, you know, career or your playing time uh, will really help you, uh, you know, keep your skills up, find new skills, learn new songs, and so it's it's coming very handy. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Now, you're, you're also a graphic designer, mm -hmm. and uh, how, I, 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 there's a lot of folks who, uh, you know, hold an extra job while they're trying to do uh, uh, the music. Sure. And... You know, some people have creative jobs, some people have non-creative jobs. Right. And I'm kind of curious, you know, how does that intermingle? Do you, do you find it that, I mean, do you worry about, like, using too much creativity in one job and not the other, or does it feed into each other? I It, it definitely balances. I, I, I don't, if I was, you know, um, you know, writing stock music for eight hours a day or something mm -hmm. like that for a, a stock house or something uh, of that sort, uh, I might be too tired to produce music when I come home. But being in the visual arts, doing mm -hmm. graphic design, um, basically, I feel like I can kind of turn that side of my brain off, you know, at, in, during, the, during the day, and then come home and, and turn my attention to music. And when I first started playing the guitar, it was it was funny because when I first wanted to write music, I thought, well, I can come home from my day job and you know, get garage band and fiddle around, do that stuff. And then I realized I don't want to spend that much more time on a, on a computer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, I was spending a lot of time on a computer as it was with a, a typical nine to five. And so it really drove me even harder to just get really good at an acoustic instrument, which is really nice. It was a bit of a relief, but you know, the real, the real thing that's paid off from, from having been a, a graphic designer is just getting that sense of marketing, mm -hmm. um, you know, which is really helps in terms of, you know, producing your own marketing graphics or just understanding how to send stuff off to a printer, um, you know, working when you get CDs manufactured or posters done or making stickers and stuff like that, um, as well as being really in tune with digital marketing trends. So, you know, being active on social media, um, being able to know how to send out a, a monthly newsletter and what are the best tools to use for that. So that's been the biggest advantage. But, um, you know, I'd say it, I always say that at the end of the day, like if, if I wasn't having to spend eight hours on a computer a day, you know, I'd come home and probably probably be much more of a producer. <laughs> sure, sure, <laughs> right? sure, sure. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, the creative process for you, how you sure. develop songs. Uh, I noticed that you had uh, received an honorable mention for mm -hmm. your song Demons on Your Sleeves. Yep. Uh, and uh, we could either talk about that specifically. How did you come about with that song come up with that song or? Yeah, I think well, it was one of those things where where you know a lot of us turn to songwriting because we're either going through something personally or we see a friend going through something personally and we want to be able to get that out in song. And you know, at one point, I kind of thought that everybody has that. Everybody has something that they're, you know, whether it's an inner demon, whether it's, um, uh, you know, something that they're struggling with at home. But we don't always see that, you know. And and the only way to maybe sometimes be able to show empathy or compassion is to actually understand what someone's going through. So a lot of the times we talk about, you know, having our heart on our sleeves, but I thought it would be you know, a little bit different to, to phrase it differently um, and have it be demons on your sleeves because if we all knew what our struggles were, you know, which is, is oftentimes very hidden, we might be just a nicer society. We mm -hmm. might understand and, you know, the person walking down the street who, who uh, you know, maybe bumps into you or whatever, they may be going through a really hard time at home and you don't know why they, you know, had their head down and didn't get out of the way. And then if we knew that, it would be a lot easier for us to empathize. Um, so that's, that's the genesis of the song. And then, um, you know, the, 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 the process for that was sort of, you know, coming up with the chorus. And I, sometimes the choruses come first for me and, and then finding your way to that. But 
that was a, a real exercise in editing. I think when I first wrote that song, it felt like it was seven minutes long, and uh -huh. just and I remember playing it live, and you know, being halfway into through the song and saying, "This is just too long." And so, being able to go back and trim that until you know, I think it's maybe four forty-five or something like that, sure, which is still sure. a long song, but um, but at least uh, you know, when I produced it on on had it produced on an album. Um, it came out sounding pretty good. Well, that that the hook, the hook in the chorus is mm -hmm. really really catchy. I mean, it just oh, really you. stands out. It's uh, that that was I was when I was listening to your music last night. Um, it was just yeah, that that's a really great great hook. Great. It's one of the only songs that uh, on that EP that that is more piano driven. Mm -hmm. um, because and and it was nice to be able to after having you know put so much time into guitar. Uh, go back and kind of brush off my piano skills to to play that one, but you know, unfortunately, I can't. There's not a lot of pianos around, so I can't really play it too much uh, live on the piano. So I, I do have a guitar version of it as well. Well, now that album, uh -huh. uh, what was the name of that album? Uh, Here again? and Now is Home. That, now that was nominated for, or you actually did you receive the award for the Whammy, or you were nominated for Whammy uh, for Best Singer Songwriter? That was album? nomination, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then yeah. the uh, Demons on Your Sleeve was the honorable mention. So mm -hmm. from I think the Songwriter Association. Of Washington, but um, it's you know there's a, a tough crowd in 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 D.C. There's a lot of talented singer songwriters sure. there, and uh, and it's just obviously just an honor to 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 be you know recognized. So, yeah, uh, you are on the Denver Arts and Venues Music Advisory pa panel. Yeah, uh, what 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 does that entail? So, Denver Arts and Venues owns Red Rocks, owns oh. um, a couple other of major venues, the 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 McNichols uh, Center there. In Denver, um, and they are basically in charge of those venues, but they also run um, sort of some arts programming throughout the city of Denver. Mm -hmm. And I, in uh, uh, my previous life in DC, had started a, a local music initiative um, called Listen Local First. And there were a couple of people here in the Denver area that had kind of gotten wind of that, or when when I moved here uh, to Denver, um, when I met, started networking in the Denver area got to talking about local music initiatives and so I was lucky enough to be invited um, to participate on the board for the Denver uh, Denver Arts and Venues Music Advisory Panel and what they do is each year um, they've got a set amount of grant money and we uh, solicit uh, applications from the public most of the time it's uh, organizations that are creating music opportunities for it might be kids um, you know disadvantaged kids uh, uh, or up to uh, you know, might be adults who have disabilities. Um, so, so any large swath of music programming, we basically want to empower organizations to uh, allow people to, to to experience music. You know, uh, both in the home and out in schools. Um, and so, I, as part of the uh, advisory panel, we review the grant process and uh, you know, kind of vote for who we think uh, you know has the best chance of affecting more people with music and uh, it's my just finished up the second year of being on that panel which is great um, they're giving out uh, I think it's around a hundred and five or so thousand dollars uh, wow. per year to some really great organizations that just um, you know really understand that music can change people's lives mm. uh, and if you create enough programming um, and you have got enough structure around that uh, you can uh, you know not only e expose uh, people to music that they might not get that you know whether it's in school whether it's in um, outside of school or at home or uh, give them opportunities to actually play themselves um, and you know it's why we get into um, uh, songwriting because we know it changes our lives and I think that's something that 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 we see um, you know is a very good potential that uh, other organizations you know can do that as well well, empathy I noticed is that's one of the the big catchwords on your on your on your uh, website. Yeah, that's a big yeah. deal that you think it's a. It really is, and I think I mean there's, there's a lot of people you know if you if you kind of stick your stick your toes in the in the in the social media universe, there's um, a lot of people talking about empathy, mm -hmm. and and if we had more empathy uh, for others, you know, we might be able to see other people's perspectives more. Uh, walk walk a mile in someone else's shoes. That is, has always been important, but I think ever so more now that we feel like we're more connected because of social media, but uh, oftentimes we find ourselves not knowing who our neighbors are. Sure. You know, things of that nature. And so, um, you know, I, I got into songwriting, you know, the, the more that I've thought about it, I've got into songwriting because of empathy. I really think that 
when you're going through something, you know, uh, an emotional challenge, large or small, I don't, this is a personal opinion, I don't, it doesn't really serve us that well. But the real purpose is when you meet another person who's gone through that similar experience, mm -hmm. you have this bond that really brings you together and helps you get through that, helps you get over that. And I think songs do that. And mm -hmm. so that's that's a big reason why, uh, why you know, I continue to write, I continue to believe that, that music has that power to connect people, bring them together, to get us to see other perspectives. Um, and so em empathy is a big, a big part of, of, uh, of songwriting. And um, I think it's a big part of songwriting, even if, even if people aren't setting out to do that. It's, you know, when I put my emotions out there and someone uh, can connect with that, instantly, you know, empathy is, is mm. occurring and, and vice versa. Yeah. Fantastic. Right. Yeah. Well, this is a question I like to ask all of the featured artists sure. who come in here. Um, but was there ever a, a time where you really felt like you just wanted to quit the music business and that you were just fed up and you just were uh, just kind of maybe the pit of despair or whatever. You just didn't feel like you wanted to go forward, but somehow you pulled through. And, and, and how did you do that? So when I left, as I mentioned that I lived in D.C. for six years, and at some point you either stay there for life or you move on, mm -hmm. I think this is, is what I found. And I decided to move back to the Dallas area where I, a lot, most of my family was from to spend more time with family, kind of regroup and figure out what I wanted to do next. And a big part of that question was, was music going to be a part of that? It's so hard in this day and age to make a living playing music, and especially when you're only playing original music, uh, as I do. And so I had to really question how much of my time can I put in this, you know, and not get any serious financial, you know, reward back to pay bills or things of that nature. And that was a that was a struggle because, um, you know, everybody wants to be able to to well. You know, my goal has never been to be famous. My goal has always just been able to make a living playing music. Yeah. Um, and so those are two very different things. And, you know, it takes a long time to do both. Um, and I, it probably takes a longer time to figure out how to make a living playing music. Mm -hmm. And because of that, I struggled with, with um, you know, why I was playing music. Was it, for, was it just for me? Was, it, was I just looking for attention? Um, you know, if it wasn't bringing in any money, could I you know, really uh, uh, rationalize, continue doing it. And that, while that took a lot of time, I kept playing and kept doing those things. But, you know, there comes a time when you realize that it's just who you are. Um, and it doesn't really matter so much if you are going to get recognized for it, notoriety. None of that you know, is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. What is guaranteed is that I can sit in a room and write a song. Yeah. And when I started to accept that and really make that important to why I continue to write, um, I started getting more involved into it, um, from the end, which was, you know, here in Denver uh, in, in the Front Range. And that was a bit of a turning point for me because I knew it was, you know, after all those other considerations were off the table, that at the end of the day, I still enjoy coming home and, and, and writing music, going out and performing that music, seeing the reaction that my music and other people's music can have in the audience and that having them come up to you and say, that meant something to me. Yeah. That kernel of, of sort of um, uh, just experience is something that brings me back to the music and something that I want to keep doing, you know, forever. That's incredible. That's great. Yeah. So um, it just occurred to me, uh, since you've been in the, the Dallas scene, you've been in the Washington, D.C. scene, mm -hmm. now you're in the Denver scene. Yep. How do the, how do the different scenes compare? How are the, yeah. They're, it's, it's really different because, you know, in D.C., which is the first sort of scene that I was a, a part of, there's so many other competing factors, um, especially when people it comes to people's notions of what DC is. People think politics and government, um, and and you know large museums and tourism and all that's there. But if you live in DC for long enough, you start realizing that you know the guy who works at the bar down the street just happens to live here. Mm -hmm. You know, and you really get to meet a lot of people. You get to notice the art scenes that are below the surface, 
And that was the real benefit of having been able to live there for longer than just, you know, two years or, a, you know, a senatorial term or something like that. Yeah. Um, um, and so, so we had to struggle often, the artists in D.C., to just convince people outside of D.C. that there was a scene there. And, mm. and, and that meant, um, you know, maybe it was, you know, forming a community with like-minded musicians, putting on shows having people doing show, show exchanges from people who are in New York, Philadelphia. And so we really kind of took it upon ourselves to say there is a music scene here um, and and it's growing and it's doing really, really strong now. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how much DC has grown just as a city over the last you know 10 or so years. But um, that was kind of an interesting and unique aspect about DC in particular was that not a lot of people think that there's you know anything other than the government politics yeah. there, but there's quite a bit. Well, you played at the Smithsonian. I did, that, yeah. yeah. Well, and it, you know when you have such a large arts anchor as the Smithsonian Institution, um, you know they do uh, reach out into the local community um, to find artists to play their different events um, to to support. Um, you know, I think right as of right now, it's just about to end. The Smithsonian did a year of music, hmm. um, and each day or each week they would release um, or a different music uh, museum institution would would feature either a different artist or maybe it's a, a musical artifact from their collection. So um, having those large uh, uh, art institutions there often give a lot of exposure to local artists um, as well as you know even just performance opportunities there um, in, in the city. So it was, it was, it's cool to have that there, but also even better when they look a little bit deeper and under uh -huh, that uh -huh. bureaucratic layer and say, there's a lot of great artists in this community. Let's bring them to the forefront. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, how about, how about the Dallas scene? What's that like? The Dallas scene is, is, you know, I think people always, when they think music and think Texas, they think Austin. Yeah. Austin city limits. You've got, you know, a long established culture, you know, uh, the festival, um, the, the TV show, it's, and so in the recent years, Dallas has been a place where more artists have either stayed or have relocated to because from an affordability standpoint, it was much more affordable than Austin. Sure. Um, the scene is a little bit smaller, so maybe you're making some, some bigger waves as an individual mm -hmm. artist. The, the talent there is top notch, the, the studios there are great, um, and, and it's a bigger city, uh, which does, you know, if you do kind of get your head above water, there are some, there's a lot of, you know, radio stations there, um, uh, uh, there's KUTs in, in Austin and then KXTs in, in, in the Dallas area uh, that'll promote local music. And so, um, you know, diverse scenes of all different genres, um, uh, but then, you know, you've got really big names that have come out of there, you know, from a singer-songwriter standpoint, there's the Nora Jones, you know, um, from, from rap and R&B, there's Erica Badu, and so those uh, artists really serve as, as um, you know, a beacon for so many others to follow. Um, so I, I found the scene to be really welcoming and warm, um, good singer-songwriter scene, uh, you know, big city, so, so you can make your niche there. How are you feeling about the, well, not just the Denver scene, but the Front Range right now? Well, and it's, it's funny, because I, I mentioned I was up in Fort Collins uh, playing uh, earlier this month, and what's interesting about the Front Range is that if you're an artist and you're in Denver, you can play a show there on a Friday night, and then you could drive to <laughs> Fort Collins for a Saturday day show. Sure. And not expect to kind of, you know, you, you, you're not going to expect your, your, your Denver folks to drive all the way up with you, which is really great because it's all within an hour, 45 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, an hour and a half away from each other. So I, I think it could really allow independent artists a, a much easier way of growing their fan base. Because if I can book shows, you know, three or four shows in three or four different towns within an hour, an hour and a half drive, mm -hmm. that's... Um, you know, if you were to do that in Dallas, you might, or in Texas, you might be driving three or four hours. Yeah, you no know, kidding. just a logistics standpoint is is a big difference. You know, each um, city has you know distinct scenes. I mean, the the Lafayette, Longmont, um, Fort Collins has a really big singer songwriter scene. Denver feels more band, um, you know, indie band, um, and then of course a lot of other genres. But um, and I'm hoping the singer songwriter scene picks up there. Boulder, you know. 
I, I've gone to, I've played shows in Boulder and they say, you have to come out here. This is where all the singer songwriter fans are. I mean, it's just kind of a mixed bag, but, um, but it's, it's really interesting to see how uh, the little ecosystems of, of music scenes can coexist yeah. and, and really be, you know, allow for someone to grow in each town. You meet a whole new set of, of, uh, of uh, not just fans or, or people who are into the music, but like-minded artists that you can, you know, do show trades for or, um, or whatnot. So it's, it's, I think that's been the most interesting thing to me is when I first moved up here, I thought that, you know, oh, well, if I have a show in Denver on a Friday, you know, I'm not going to book anything anywhere else, you know, within mm-hmm. the three hour range. That's how typically how it is in most major metropolitan areas. But, um, but it's, it's really nice to see that, that, you know, in, in the smaller towns and, and suburbs around Denver, they have their own music scene, which is great. Hmm. Yeah. So, um, to some of the young up and comers mm-hmm. or the old up and comers, <laughs> the, uh, um, what, what, what kind of recommendations would you have for breaking into the, to the music scene today? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I mentioned earlier how, you know, if you're looking to make money, I would go into a different profession. Yeah. Um, that's just not, not really part of it. Uh, the younger you start, the better. It just gives you more, you know, m- more to fall back on. Um, but when you're in school, you know, finding, uh, you know, a profession in addition to or, um, or a, a primary profession that will uh, allow you to make a living and subsidize your art, I think is the most important thing. Mm. You know, we're not all going to be superstars and, you know, when we're 14, get signed and go, yeah. you know, m- you know, be singing in front of thousands of people for the rest of our lives. Most of us are going to have to uh, see the bigger picture, see uh, that the returns are going to take a lot longer, and being willing to invest in that early on. So coming out of high school, you know, f- first of all, in high school, just play as much as you possibly can. I mean, yeah. that's really the, the gist of it. Practice, play, live it, make friends. Um, that's been one of, the, one of the best things is that, you know, even though I got into music as of late, uh, or later in life, uh, my friend group has primarily centered around those people that I made through music. We just, we think alike, uh, we, we um, uh, look out for each other, we support each other, and that's really important, that community. But then once you go into to college, it's, it's important to continue your musical um, skills and, and development. Um, but at the same time, if you were to get a marketing degree, you now know how to promote your own music. If you, um, if you, even if you got a degree in accounting, you know, being an independent musician is about being a small business. Yeah. If you don't have those basic skills, you know, you're only going to get so far or you're going to have to pay someone else to do it, which is just another thing to add to your overhead. So adjacent skills really, really help independent musicians. Um, if it's, you know, creating posters, you know, you can create band posters for your friends, you know, little things like that, um, you know, can really help. Uh, um, you make connections, um, uh, you know, piggyback off other people, do swaps for a trade swap, you know. I know how to, uh, maybe I can design a poster and you know how to do some live recording or live photography. Mm -hmm. That is a great creative swap that can really help artists. So things like that are going to last you, you know, your whole life. Um, So it's it's good to, to sort of add as many of those aspects to your tool belt as you can. So what kind, of, what kind of projects are you working on right now or that, that you have upcoming? Yeah, I'm excited for 2020. I mean, 2019 was um, really my first year that I f- fully recommitted back to music here in the, oh, the, okay. the Front Range area. So it started off, um, you know, really, uh, really great with some, some uh, listening room shows uh, early on in the year. And I just kept playing live. And then when in August, when I uh, had a birthday and turned 40, I decided to go on a big tour. And well, it was a small tour, but it was a long distance. I <laughs> sure. went back to Texas, uh, where my friends and family were, and ended up getting to play um, a show at Charlie Pride's recording studio. Oh, wow. he, he lived and worked in Dallas for a long time, if not still, um, and had a recording studio that had kind of been going unused for a number of years. But he reached an agreement with um, uh, a, a local, uh, a well-known local songwriting and musician family and they took it over to produce live acoustic concerts. So I was able to book a show there and play um, a live show in front of a ticketed audience of friends and family, and they recorded the whole thing. So one of the first releases I'm uh, excited about for 2020 is a live acoustic album 
um, that I'll I'll have I'll produce in a, a sort of a limited edition you know quantity maybe 200 or so, um, and we'll have you know full liner notes and, and a nice fold out um, you know kind of liner notes of all when people used to sit down and read uh -huh. their liner oh, yeah, notes yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, and 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 really get that out there. Um, but I'm excited that it's in front of a, of a live audience, which just you know adds for a lot of vibrancy to the show, um, and then. Uh, later on, whether it be mid-spring or, or, or early summer, I've got a, a four-song EP, a studio EP that I'm really looking forward to. It's in mixing at the moment, so um, you know, uh, uh, ticking off the, the to-do list on, on that album. Um, but it was recorded and uh, engineered um, here in Denver, uh, which I'm excited about, and with a lot of Denver musicians, everybody, you know, nobody that I knew before going into the EP making process. So two big releases. Um, I'll do you know a music video or two um, over the course of the year, and just play a lot more shows. All right. Yeah. All right. So what? Did, what? How did you uh, come to hear about uh, Soundbridge music? It was it was all online. I mean, the, the, if you're a singer songwriter in the front range, you know, you're always looking for different uh, places to play, different people to connect with, and um, Soundbridge, uh, you know, had been putting up the videos online on their own website. I think that's maybe how I came across it. Um, but, you know, being in D.C., doing a little bit of stuff in Dallas and then in Denver, local music community is really important to me. And what Soundbridge Music was starting and is doing um, and, and looks like they, you know, hope to achieve is just really cementing that local music community and then, you know, reaping the benefits, which is everybody's more connected. There's more playing opportunities for everybody. Um, uh, you know, when I need a session musician to come sit on uh, uh, a song of mine, I have a, a much bigger Rolodex to look mm -hmm. at. Um, those are all things that are important uh, to, to artists, and it's important why, uh, um, you know, organizations like Soundbridge Music put the energy into that and fostering that community. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to catch Renee live sometime soon. Maybe Check back next month for our next featured artist. If you're interested in learning more about Soundbridge Music and becoming a part of Music for Change, check us out at soundbridgemusic.org.